Good morning, church. Happy Lord's Day. Happy Father's Day. Uh, and to my Hendersonville people, I got to give a shout out. Which camera? Shout out to my Hendersonville campus. Love you guys. Miss you guys. Um, man, I'm trusting that the team took care of you guys, got you the bacon you need, and uh, here we go. All right. Um, hey, one church, different location this morning, okay? So uh, thankful for you. Um, this morning, I'm particularly thankful not just to preach and respond to God's word and worship with you all through singing and study, but, um, and also not just for the smell of bacon as I walked in this morning, um, but thankful, thankful for a community of fathers. Um, we honor you today. We want to restore the dignity of fatherhood this morning and thank you and honor you this morning. And so thank you for you guys as a community of fathers here that serve here, that worship here, and then also thankful for my father. He's a a great pastor and a, a, a better dad. And so that's about as sentimental as Frank's get. So gift cards in your inbox. Um, St. Augustine, an early church father of the church, wrote in his autobiography, and he says these famous lines about human identity. He makes a statement, you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. So to start off, our friend Augustine makes a statement, a claim about who you are and who I am as people. He claims we were made for someone and a purpose. The desires, the longings of our heart are now, he uses the word, restless. A restless heart. Not a restless mind or a restless body, but at the center of who we are, the core longings of our heart. Now, that's a great quote, but later on in his autobiography, he, he has a less famous quote that builds on this, okay? Um, and I think this is so appropriate for today's teaching text. He describes our desires, our human longings, our desires like gravity, Gravity says this, a body by its weight tends to move towards its proper place. That's called getting older. <laughs> Fire tends to move up, a stone downwards. Water poured on soil sinks below. Things which are not in their intended position are restless. Once they are in their ordered position, they find rest. Restlessness. Again, Augustine, and I would suppose us as well, you and I, we know that you can't just detach yourself from things that you follow, things that you worship. Um, you can't just say, I'm not going to love this today, right? They've been trained. Your heart follows. Your heart worships something. It gives weight towards something. We all know this. And restlessness happens, and it's a warning sign to us that your order is wrong. The order of your loves is out of place. They're in the wrong order. And so this restless heart that you may have brought in this morning, it's a warning. It's an indicator that you're giving your attention, your worship, to something that cannot give you what you desire. It's unable to support your quest and your desires that you say, man, I have these desires, I have these longings, I have these achingness. Maybe even some of their desires are good, but they cannot support you. It's not that they're bad, but that they're disordered. They're in the wrong order. And so what he's saying and what I believe Jesus is inviting us to is to discover that your heart follows something, you are always worshiping something, and you are always giving weight to someone or something. We looked at it, John chapter 4, right, a few weeks ago. The woman at the well, everybody worships, and the Father is seeking worshipers. People who, are, who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus this morning invites us to give over, to redirect our desires to himself, that our hungry souls can find satisfaction. So in this text, God the Father invites hungry souls like you and I to feast on the bread of life. The anchor text that Caleb read, verse 35, 
John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Again, can I just say from the get-go, we're going to go phrase by phrase, line by line, but can I just say to begin, your desires, the aching of your heart does not scare Jesus. It doesn't scare him. In fact, he invites you to redirect those desires and those longings and to say, I am bread for your soul. I am a fresh cup of water for your thirsty soul where you can find satisfaction. So it's important. The context is super important here as we study. So at the beginning of this chapter, we see God in the wilderness. Verse 1 through 15, you see God in the wilderness. And there's a massive crowd, as you guys are reading. And um, I love this because there's an interaction with the disciples. They gather around. The disciple Philip says simply, the cost is too great. Are you kidding me? 200 denarii worth of food could not feed the 15,000, 20,000 people we see here, right? Eight months salary, right? Just give it over to the crowd. Andrew, I love this, the, the other disciple says simply, so not that the cost is too great, but the supply is too small. The supply is too small. This is like some loaves and a garnish, like pickled fish, right? But then you see God in the wilderness, Jesus himself providing miraculously. Not a God of scarcity this morning. Not a God of scarcity, but a God of abundance. God in the wilderness providing for his people out of his abundance. This is like a Publix bakery on demand, okay? Publix bakery on demand, Olive Garden breadsticks all the way to the back. Can you imagine 15,000 people all the way to the back, row 20,000 of 20,000, like up there, right? If you're in the crowd, you're like, I don't know who this guy is, but just can you keep passing the breadsticks, right? This is what Jesus is doing. And then Jesus says, no problem. In fact, there's going to be some bread left over. Gather it all so that it may not be lost. It's an important phrase. Gather it all so that, they not, so that the bread may not spoil. And then verse 15 says that the crowd wanted to take him and make him king. Man, imagine if this guy could like do this with like some positional authority and he's not in the wilderness, but let's put him in a palace. They want him to be king. They try to make him king. And so they desired, again, key word, they desired a king. They wanted a ruler. And they said, hey, we're going to be satisfied for a moment, but we got to take this guy. we got to use this guy. How can we do it? And the text says that they were filled and, has a, and had as much as they wanted. Physically, for just a moment. The story about feeding the crowd is significant. I think it's important to locate Jesus in this moment before he drops the hammer. So it's important to see where we are in this book. He's been revealing himself. He's been revealing himself to various types of people. First, John the Baptist, Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. He, he then goes to a wedding, right? Water turns into wine, a picture of the kingdom of God. It's here. It's now. Get ready. He goes to Nicodemus, then he goes to the woman at the well. He says, you will be thirsty again. You will be thirsty again if you just stay here. But I have living water for you. And then last week we saw, man, chapter 5, the crowd begins to gather because now there's a healer. Now there's a miracle worker. And so the question is, when you see Jesus, when you see Jesus, what do you see? See, for the crowd, Jesus was their ticket to freedom, and they needed a king to do it, right? They needed a king to actually implement the dreams and desires that they had. And so Jesus is intentionally set up in various ways to be their new redeemer, but not the redeemer they think, not the redeemer that they actually wanted. He's set up like a Moses figure, which is key, because this is also, it says, during the Feast of Passover, Feast of Passover, which was a feast. It would be a citywide celebration of rescue and joy. Rescue and joy. And the crowd has the idea physically for a moment, let's try and get this guy to do 
what we want. The irony this morning is that Jesus is offering them what they need most. Only they see a bankroll commodity for their physical needs. So Jesus is going to confront them, lovingly confront you and I this morning about who he is. He comes to correct and invite us and offers us true life. He offers us true life. We actually pick this up in verse 26 if you want to read. Right away, Jesus confronts the crowd. Remember, just before this, we studied last week, the lake, right? The Sea of Galilee. Hey, they're here. They cross the other side. Jesus is with them. We are called to look up or look out and look up to Jesus. He gets on the other side and the crowd's like, hey, Jesus, when did you get here? Right? They want to take him and make him king. So right away, Jesus confronts the crowd and says, you were seeking me because you saw the signs and were filled. You saw the miracle and you got bread. They had seen the miracle, but instead of drawing closer to Jesus himself, they grew closer to the vending machine of miracles that they wanted. So they're amazed at him, and and here's the word for this morning. I, I do think that we are amazed in the same way. The temptation for us is to be amazed in the crowd the same way. Jesus plus fill in the blank. Jesus plus this, and I'm good. Family, job, status. Jesus plus bread. Jesus plus this. What if Jesus could do this? Imagine if he did this for us. The temptation of the crowd is the temptation for today as well. Verse 27, I love this Jesus. John chapter 6, Jesus is like out of control, okay? Verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man I will give to you. Now, in an agrarian society, at one level, they actually do work for their meals, right? They actually just finished working, and they need to prepare food, and also they're in the wilderness, and so they actually do need their meal. This isn't about snacking, right? He's not talking about preserving your snacks. They worked for their food, but it does perish. It does perish. It's interesting, the word perish, um, your translation, depending on what you read, it may say lost or even spoiled. Don't work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures to life. On one level, sure, don't work for food that perishes. You will be hungry again. It's like one level, right? The next level, again, these are, this is a Jewish crowd largely. And so later in the chapter, he will actually rebuke their stubborn hearts for trusting in the Old Testament leaders like Moses for propping up their religious system and says, you trust in those things and think they have life. He lovingly corrects them just right from the get-go and says, this will spoil again. This, whatever you're trusting in, will spoil yet again. So the God of the scriptures that they're reading and think that there's life in the scriptures, they point to the one in front of them just right in front of them. Again, what do you see when you see Jesus? He says, hey, do you think this will find life? No, this will spoil. Those works you do for contentment, it's a bad deal. The order is wrong. You will still be restless. You will be restless. The the things you work for, approval from others over God, it will be spoiled by their rejection. If you work for money over God, it will spoil. Whether you realize this at a young age or an old age, you can't take it with you, it will spoil. It will perish. If you work for a status or a position, it will be spoiled by the eventual humility that you experience. Even good things, right? Even good things that are God-given, when they're in the wrong order, they will spoil. It will all spoil Um, Mark Sayers, uh, a pastor in Australia, he says this, the fruit of your own success and good works can never sustain you. The good works, even the good things you do, were never meant to be the nourishment that sustains you. 
Good things were never made for you to consume, but to redirect back to the bread of life. So it's perishing and it's spoiling. Good morning, welcome to church. Jesus will later say, I am the life, I am truth, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. All other ways, all other truth, all other status will spoil. It will spoil, which is also amazing when he makes this statement later. The Son of Man will give you. The Son of Man, it also says, has set, been set the seal. The seal of approval, the seal of authorization is on Jesus alone. It's on Jesus alone who has the authority to reveal the Father, who accomplishes his mission because he's been sent. Later on, he'll say he has been given to give life to the world. Life to the world. Jesus alone reveals the Father. And you see this throughout the chapter. You see this throughout the Gospel of John. First, what, is it, what do we see? The Messiah. Could this be the Messiah? John the Baptist, could this be the Lamb? John chapter 4, could this be the prophet? Could this be the king? This title, these titles are given to Jesus alone. In today's culture, we are on the same quest to put identity statements on Jesus, right? Remember, our hearts are following. Your heart, my heart, we are searching. We are giving weight. We are worshiping someone aching to be filled, only we can't find it. How's that working for you, Jesus says. Influence, success, the ache of uh, purposelessness cannot sustain you, right? I think the great resignation, right, the last few years, we, we've seen this on a, on a tiny picture, one of those realities where we can't find or we're struggling, many people are struggling to find stability, to find an anchor for their life. And they are searching. They're aching for that stability. And what Maslow talks about is the actual actualization of yourself. If myself is the highest need, if I need to find those desires fulfilled, that's number one. It has to be filled. And so Jesus says to us this morning, it will end. And he says this as good news, that it will spoil, because then he's going to direct him, he's going to direct us to himself. You will be hungry again. Or C.S. Lewis puts it, even the best things of this world never keep their promise. Even the best things of this world cannot keep the promises they say they make. So, this morning, gospel news, gospel good news for you. What does Jesus offer that's better? What is worth taking the risk what is worth forsaking and reordering your entire life around Jesus? What's worth it of leaving the curiosity of the crowd and following Jesus? The invitation this morning. Work for food that endures to eternal life. Now, Jesus gives this eternal life. He gives us these things, but... Jesus is not interested in, A, preserving food like a Ziploc baggie from heaven. B, he's not clinging to a Jewish religious system that was protected by the authorities. Like Moses, they were propping him up to be this new figure. No, he's not interested in that. And he's also not interested in building earthly status as a miracle worker. Every time he would do something, what did he do? He removed himself, vanished. It's not my time yet. He's on his way to the cross. He's on his way to why he has been sent to give eternal life. Again, he's going to act like Moses. He is the new redeemer, but not like the crowd thinks. Not like the crowd wants him to. So this Jesus here this morning does not offer you self-help suggestions. He doesn't offer you upgrades. Wrestling with this this morning, this is tough medicine but it's food that endures to life. He says, I am nourishment. Not I give you nourishment. I am nourishment for your aching soul. The spiritual hunger that you have, the journey that you're on, must find the bread of life. 
Direct your cravings to me and me alone, Jesus is saying. The provision, the miracle of feeding the 5,000 was to point to the provider, right? The provision points to the provider. Not just physical bread for the crowd, but true life offered to anyone who would come. So he, gave, he came to give us true life. And the text says eternal life. Life unto the age, it can be translated. Jesus took this phrase straight from the Old Testament. Life unto the age to come. It's a beautiful phrase. Jesus takes it and says, I will offer you the kind of life that the age of God, of life, and the age of man, death, meet in Jesus. And Jesus is point blank. He says the way to life is through death. And he would be that example. This life is offered now. It starts today and goes for eternity. It will not spoil. Though the body may die, Jesus says life unto the age. Life forever. Offered now, but death is not the end. Later in the text, if you read the whole, gospel, or the whole chapter of chapter 6, he'll say, I will raise them up on the last day. The last day will not end in death, but me raising, providing, giving life to those who trust in me. I will bring them up. So multiple times in this chapter, Jesus offers himself as life. He uses metaphors like um, overflowing like a river, bread that never spoils, right? He uses these images not for us to ta- have some nice takeaways. No, to redirect our aching hearts, our aching desires to him and to him alone. Verse 28, now we see the crowd. The crowd's responding. Hey, ha- what do we have to do? Give us this bread always. What, what, what can we do? So now we see the crowd asking, okay, that sounds awesome. Good deal. We work for food that spoils. We would love for it to never stop. Please. Jesus says one way. Jesus has one way to find our hungry souls satisfied. Belief. He uses this word, Belief, belief in him. They, they say, hey, we need more validation. He says, you need belief. You need to come to me. They have a proposition. They use the Old Testament. This is like good Bible study. They're like, hey, we know our Bible too. We would like to quote uh, the Old Testament, please. Okay. Moses even gave us bread. What about you? Moses gave us bread. What about you? This is interesting. In Psalm 78, This is the interpretation of this Old Testament story of Moses in the wilderness. Psalm 78 is kind of interpreting what happened there. In verse verse 18, God had provided for them in the wilderness. Psalm 78 is this restoring, retelling of what happened. And it says, They tested God in their hearts by demanding the food they craved. The food that they desire. The mentality of the crowd is not just like a today thing. It's not just a John 6 thing. It's a human thing. They wanted the desires. They wanted the bread. They wanted the miracles. Even back then, at the beginning of our Bibles. The heart like a crowd. The heart like a crowd that follows for the vending machine miracles. Later in uh, that psalm, verse 29, it mentions their cravings were filled, and while the food was on their lips, it says the food was on their mouth, God was angered because the crowd was using God. Not to remain faithful to the giver, not to thank God for his provision, but because their cravings were satisfied and it drew their hearts away from him. Drew their hearts away from him. And so here's where it gets beautiful. This is where the text gets beautiful, because Jesus corrects them. He says, yeah, you think it's Moses. No, no, no. My father provided. You think it was Moses. You think it was the messenger. It was my father. He is giving you the true bread once again, if you have eyes to see. If you can just see it, I'm giving it to you again. 
I'm giving you the bread that you desire. I'm offering your hungry souls to be satisfied yet again if you can see me. Bread from heaven is me. So it's not the messenger. It's not Moses. It's the Father. That's the source. This is like um, when my wife and I, sorry to spoil this for you, when my wife and I, um, when we get invited to like a party or like a, lately it's like two-year-old parties um, or a birthday party or a wedding, if you invite us, that's great. Thank you so much. But if you do, just to FYI, to just go ahead and say it, if this is, the, this is like if my wife goes and gets the card, gets the present, does all the work, signs the card, and then she's like, hey, you can sign it. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, hey, you can sign it and then just go to the party and do it and deliver it. It's like from me, I did none of the work. It's from us, right? Dads, you understand this. You get it, right? Just sign your name, you know, make it happen. That's what, that's a funny example, but that's what believing Moses as the source of life is like. Moses like signed the manna and said, here, the source was God the Father. The source was God the Father. Just the messenger, right? And that's a funny example, but you see the picture. The Father lovingly and freely gave the bread. Here's what Jesus is saying. A loving Father freely giving the faithful Son. And the Son then offers hungry souls life. That's beautiful. A loving Father freely giving the Son who then offers us hungry people life. Michael Reeves, a theologian, calls this the difference between a father and a fuhrer. The difference between a father and a dictator, right? Salvation and eternal life would look completely different if we didn't see this picture in John 6. It would look completely different. Again, if God was not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what we just sang about, If God was not three in one, we would get protection, but from a distance. We might get forgiveness, yes, God would forgive you, but you could never get closeness. You could see power, you could see miracles, but you would never get compassion. That's the difference we see here, the difference between a father and a fuhrer. But, This is the good news of the gospel. Can I just give you gospel food this morning? The father rejoiced at sharing the love of his son and sent him to you and sent him to me and says, take, eat, believe, come to me to find life, life unto the age, starving souls searching for fulfillment. The offer is the bread of of life. God offers us this morning, this is absolutely wild, God offers us union with himself. To peel back the curtain of the love of the Father and the love of the Son so intimate and close that they freely share with you and I. Ridiculous. Amazing. Jesus shares what he already has with the Father. Martin Luther, sorry, this is like the greatest hits of like Christian quotes. Okay, so here we go. Luther famously describes his anger toward God in this moment. He describes his anger toward God because he sees him as a bitter, powerful God who hates sin. That's like part of it, right? That's like part of who God is. But that's all he saw. But then he got the image of a father, the fatherly love who freely gives. See, when you see a father, when you see God as a father who freely shares with you, who lovingly invites you, changes. Changes. God the Father graciously, not begrudgingly, giving us Jesus. Giving us Jesus, we see God most clearly in the giving of the Son. He was on his way to the cross. He's going to do the I am statements. He's going to go through all the chapters, and he says, my time has not come yet, but my time will come. To be lifted up, to draw everyone to myself on the cross. 
One commentator notes that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Right, we see that. Who do people say that I am? It's like a good question. But in John, he doesn't ask that. He says, I'm just going to tell you who I am. It's way more interesting. Hey, who do people say that I am? No, 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 I am bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am bread for your souls. I am the door to walk through. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am light, and I am the resurrection. He just says it. So, Jesus does not allow himself to be captured by the crowd. He doesn't allow himself to be taken up by their agendas. Again, not Jesus plus blank. Jesus and Jesus alone. So he says, my purpose is to give life through my death. King, yes. Prophet, yes. Priest, yes. But not like you think. Not like you think. So verse 28 leaves us with this. Where and how do we respond? This morning. How do we respond? A restless heart, can I tell you this morning, a restless heart does not need a religious test to pass. It does not need a folder full of facts about God. It doesn't need that. It needs rest. It needs stillness. It needs bread for life. It needs to put away the spoiled works the spoiled attempts, and to find Jesus for life. It needs to find rest. So coming to Jesus this morning, can I encourage you, it's less like climbing the mountain of religions or taking a folder and studying God, and it's more like being invited to a feast. It's more like being invited to feast on Jesus for life. That's the image of coming to God. Believing you are thirsty, believing you are hungry, and coming to God and saying, no more, no more disorder. God is one. Everything else is here. I want rest. I need that. That's coming to Jesus. Um, Elsie, my daughter of fame, okay, um, if she's hungry, she'll tell you. She points to the cabinet, yells at the cabinet, actually. And she knows where the goldfish is. She knows where dad is. And she says, mine, you, me, now, right? It's kind of the words she knows. Again, she is searching. She doesn't care who's around. Her hunger brings her. She is following her hunger. She is following her desires and says, I'm on the search. I don't care who knows. I am on the search, and I've found it, and she's just crunching on goldfish, probably right now. Again, silly example, but our hearts are the same way. Your heart, my heart, searching, aching, that only Jesus can fill. Jesus offers him, or offers us himself. If you're not a Christian in the room, can I appeal to you? Can I encourage you? Can I invite you? Come to the feast. Jesus offers bread of life that endures everything in this world. Our hearts are restless until it rests in you. It's true. To find a rest. If you don't follow him yet, can I tell you, listen to him. If you're not a Christian in the room, just listen. Consider these words. Consider the image. Consider the story. If he's speaking to you, he's drawing himself to you, he's inviting you, believe. Come to him for your aching heart. Um, Keller, Tim Keller mentions five things humans cannot live without. Real quick. He mentions five things. Meaning, satisfaction, freedom, identity, and hope. We see all of these things in the text this morning. Meaning, where is my heart going? satisfaction. What am I loving? Why do I feel restless? Freedom. Not just freedom from, I don't want to do that or that, but freedom to. Freedom to God. Identity. Who am I? Does anyone know the real me? 
And then hope. Life unto the age is your destiny. Life unto the age, no matter what, it endures to eternal life. By the way, we've had some beautiful moments here over the last few weeks at all of our campuses. We've had beautiful moments gathered together for prayer, worship, and ask God, asking God to be made whole, to pray over people. Some of you saying your prayer requests out loud for the first time to another human. That's what God is stirring up. God has been made broken so that you can be whole. That's what Jesus is offering us freely. He doesn't say, again, I will give you bread of life. He says, I am the bread of life. So Christian, there's good news for you too. Later on, Jesus will describe himself as bread again. He does this multiple times. And this is a daily, not just one time thing. This is a daily feasting on him. A daily returning to feast on him. Again, I want to give a shout out to the scripture journals that we have. It's probably one of the best ways for you to make a strong cup of coffee, put it on your calendar, and feast on Jesus. To open up the scripture journal and say, like, I'm here for bread. I am here. My thirsts have brought me here today. It's a beautiful way to do that, to see him as spiritual food for your hungry souls. Can I encourage you? And I'm done. This is my testimony, all right? Being at church every day does stuff to you, okay? Um, So this is my testimony in a lot of ways, not just knowing books on Jesus, but Jesus. Not just studying him or looking at him, but tasting. Finding soul satisfaction instead of telling others to do it. I'm right there with you. Maybe that's why I'm going to end with another Augustine quote. Sorry. Um, He had searched for everything in his life. Money, education, status, even ministry. And he he ends with this. He had looked for fulfillment in everything but God, and he says this. I love this prayer. He says to God, but you were laughing at me. Very bitter were the frustrations I endured in chasing my, there it is, my desires. But all the greater was your kindness. Your kindness in being less and less prepared to let anything other than yourself grow sweet to me. The sweetness of Jesus this morning. Do you want As a church, we've been leaning into creating some cultures of response, right? Seeing, bring, and come. I can't think of a more appropriate way, not just just to provide a space for you, but a place. Not just a space, but a place for you to respond. Either standing and singing, coming up here to pray, having aching hearts. Verse 37 ends this way. One of the most powerful words he ends with. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The Father gave his Son. The Son gives life to find satisfaction. If anyone comes to him today, he will never cast you out. Bring your heart, your tragedy, your doubt, your anger, your spoiled efforts, bring them to the bread of life. Sing to the bread of life. The cross is where he was broken so that we may be made whole. Jesus has a feast for us this morning. The only requirement is that we come hungry. Let me pray and we'll sing. Father, you have been good to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for confronting our desires. We rejoice in you, the bread of life. We repent from our spoiled efforts, attempts to find life. We ask for your grace as we stand and we give our voice to you. In your son's name, amen.